Good afternoon. My name is Amy Sadler and I am the Education and Research Manager for People3, a full service diversity and inclusion firm headquartered in Nashville, Tennessee. In the past year, the work we do in diversity and inclusion at People3 has grown substantially, but not for the reasons we may have hoped. In the past year, there has not only been devastation, but eye opening, especially for those of us who are Black in America. With the murders of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd inspiring worldwide protests, there's been a thirst for not only knowledge, but true and candid conversations. These experiences are not new. Systemic inequities continue to cost billions of dollars of potential income to be lost, homes are not allowed to be bought, unequal and inequitable options for education, and hundreds of thousands of lives torn apart due to unfair policing and disenfranchisement. Today, we want to have those tough conversations. We want to help aid in understanding what it's like to be Black in America. We want to amplify Black voices and give space for honesty and learning. I want to welcome you to Conversations in Black. On the panel today, we have Mia McNeil, Anthony Peterson, Isaac Aday, Nietzsche Scott, and Christy Pruitt-Haynes. Mia is also known as the Workshop Whisperer and is the CEO of Centaris Consulting Group, and is also a well-known and well-loved consultant in the DEI space. Tony Peterson is a TEDx speaker whose TED Talk, What I'm Learning About Race for My White Grandchildren, has more than 3 million views. Isaac Aday is a first-generation Ghanaian-American professor and CSO at Pivot Technology School. Nietzsche Scott is head of human resources at Brown Hill Music and is an HR consultant. Christy Pruitt-Hayes is also a TEDx speaker, diversity, equity, inclusion, and access strategist, and CEO of Our Truth. I want to thank you all for your participation and for the emotional labor you are giving today. Let's get started. The first question for our panel today is what has been the hardest part about this year? Last year's events, the events of last summer and ongoing continuing events. For me, one of the toughest things about last year um, was being trapped in a space that I couldn't remove myself from. Um, I think that, you know, we as a black woman and as black people, we understand everything that we go through every day. We lean into our lived experiences. And, you know, I found it tra traumatic to see, you know, to see him on the ground, to see that, to see his knee and his neck, that, that was triggering and traumatic for me. Um, and I actually had to take a step back a bit because you, I couldn't ex escape it. Generally speaking, any other time I'm working, I'm, you know, hanging out, I'm with my children, we're outside, we're doing things. And last year was the first year that you could not turn away from it. It was on television, it was on social media. And I found it to be, while every, so many people who are not black found it to be eye-opening and awakening, awakening, I found it to be very triggering and traumatic. To, to continue to live in that space. These are all great perspectives and I, I can wholeheartedly agree as a black male, 2020 and the events of 2020 were our constant reminder of my mortality. No matter how much success I attain, no matter what I achieve career-wise and beyond in life, I'm still reminded that as a black man, my mortality is front and center and it's a conversation that occurred throughout the year. And it was it was a lot. It was a lot to carry. Um, Isaac, you know, to your point, it just it's a reminder that no matter what you've accomplished, you are still black and you're going to be treated differently. Um, one of some of the hardest things about this year was having a conversation with my children about the events. Um, you had to have that conversation. It's not one that we couldn't, you know, not discuss because it was on all social media platforms. And so if you have a teenager, you need to discuss it. But I have a 10 year old son who I've not had the conversation about race yet. And whether that was a, a, a good thing to do to not have that conversation um, 
by this by the age of 10 or not it it was it was forced upon me you know this year along with the pandemic that we're currently in so to your point Mia we were like forced to deal with this issue but it is very traumatic and it's it's disheartening and it's you know we have to try to remain hopeful but it can definitely um where on your emotions one day I, I'm angry another day I'm sad another day I'm hopeful so for me it was um, the hardest part is dealing with our children um, and then one more thing um, my mom I talked to her around um, the time that these events happened with George Floyd in particular and um, she was born and raised in Mississippi and she just said this reminded her of the time that she experienced um, when she when she participated in sit-ins and so just to hear you know your mother saying that the times that we are in now is similar to what she's gone through and even thinking about my children where we want to make it a better place and so it again brings you back to that space of where are we now but also where are we going and what difference are we making so it, it's just a lot Absolutely, Nietzsche. Um, I think you made an interesting point. I think as parents, this past year, it's probably been harder than I think any of us expected parenting to be. We knew there were going to be lots of things happening in the world as we're raising children, but how do you explain that to your kids? I have, I have a Black son, and I told him often, you know, when you're driving, if you get pulled over, make sure your hands are visible, keep your ID somewhere where you can reach it without getting out of the view of the officer. And I think we got used to that conversation and this was a whole other conversation. How do you, how do you prepare your kids to not go to the swimming pool or to not go to the park? So I, I, I get it, I understand it. This has been an interesting year to put it lightly. Um, I wanna, I wanna uh, okay. uh, just one more thing thing, Amy and Nitra, especially, because when you talk about talking with our children, um, you know, you know, that's a big part of what I do. And the conversations you're talking about, they're different conversations with my white grandchildren, but there still was that opportunity this year um, and necessity. And so I am having those conversations, even with children who are not Black. Um, it, it, uh, obviously, it takes a different turn, but they are becoming aware because of, of, of the tragedies of 2020. Absolutely. Christy? Yes, I was just going to say, you know, speaking of children and anyone who has kids, loves kids, knows a kid, understands how deeply this, this affects them. Um, and I think that layered effect of, as Mia mentioned, seeing the images over and over and over again. And because of the pandemic, not being able to escape it, my daughter is 17, she's a junior in high school. And what 2020 did to her was completely change her college list. So mm -hmm. she had a long list of schools she was interested in here in the United States. That list now is almost exclusively international schools because mm -hmm. she said, I can't imagine trying to prepare for my career and my future while I am so worried about my present. So mm -hmm. I'm now as a parent having to think about what is life going to be like with the possibility of her in a different country. Um, but the other side is I don't want to discourage it because I understand one of her top choice schools was in Washington, D.C. prior to this. And she said, I can't imagine living there. It feels like there's going to be a target on that on that city at all times and I need to be as far away from it as possible. So just seeing that these events have literally changed the course of her life is something I will never forget. And, and to be honest, I will never forgive those people who caused that. Um, when we say, here's how you can be anti-racist, um, there are folks who are actively fighting that. There are um, political forces actively fighting against uh, racial justice. Um, and, and so while we have this worldwide movement of, of uh, awakening awareness to racial injustice, we also have some very powerful people basically fighting for racial injustice um, and, and even codifying that 
trying to codify that in laws um, in ways that that are more aggressive than what we've seen for for many decades. And you know, Tony, it's interesting. We do this work every day, and mm -hmm. one question that we get a lot is, "Well, redlining doesn't still happen, and this doesn't still happen." Um, it's very interesting to see. Just last month, there was a house that was appraised for less than a hundred thousand um, dollars, and then when it was reappraised with white owners, it went up half a million dollars. Mm -hmm. So it's not new, and I think it's very interesting to see that people don't realize that or that they're maybe willfully blind to the issues that we face every day. Now, I know we're all in the DEI space and we do this work daily. We talk to um, people from everywhere, but I want to kind of dive into how did these events of 2020 change your approach in the DEI space? Um, are you possibly more aggressive or less aggressive. I know for me personally, I take a step back sometimes because I'm afraid of what I'm gonna hear. And it's hard to kind of deal with that on a daily basis. So from all of you experts, I would like some other views. Well, I'll start with that. Um, uh, a couple events in 2020 uh, changed our approach. Um, first of all, uh, right after the murder of George Floyd and the, when we we knew about the murder of Breonna Taylor and the murder of Ahmaud Arbery, right after that, that time, um, there were lots of folks who wanted sort of listening se sessions to process their thinking about what has just happened. People who, who have never had race on the mind um, or, or racial justice on their mind um, have had um, this desire, this great desire to process um, what they were feeling and to think through uh, where they wanna go. And, and so frankly, it gave us lots of opportunities to, to have these conversations. When I gave my, my TED talk in 2014, it was de designed to encourage people to talk about race in our society. And um, unfortunately, the spark for those conversations came um, because of the deaths of these people. Um, and uh, and so, so it began with, with people's real desire to have those conversations and, um, and to keep those conversations going and to figure out what they can do next. But the second thing that happened in 2020 is, is sort of what I was alluding to, to in, my, in my first response, and that is we had political um, measures being taken um, to silence us, to tell us we cannot use certain words, we cannot talk about certain concepts. And so we had to get creative in the ways that we do the work we do in, in DEI spaces. And I'm really proud of um, everyone I've worked with in this space for making those pivots and being very creative um, in the ways that we have those conversations. Absolutely. I think that executive order, I remember when it came down and my first thought was, this is, you know, first it was just a, a disbelief. It was utter disbelief that there was an attempt to silence the truth in a way that I hadn't seen in the past in working in this area. Um, I am proud of so many of my clients for saying, particularly those who did have federal <laughs> contracts, for saying, we will find another way to pay for this because the fact that they don't want us to say and talk about certain things makes it that much more important. Um, but for me personally, last year made me more direct um, because I realized, and it was a reminder for me that I'm not just talking about the workplace and, and how a lot of these issues and concepts affect people at work. Because, you know, that's a lot of what we, we do every day. We talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, access, and social justice within the realms of work. What it was a reminder of is that this is also life and it's a lot more serious than whether or not somebody gets a job. So I owe it to those who don't have this voice to be very direct. So it, it changed me, it changed my approach, it changed what I wanted to focus on in a way that 
helped me feel like I was actually doing a lot more good than what I thought I'd done in the past. But again, it also made me sad that it was even necessary. And, um, and there were moments where it felt overwhelming. When you see it on the news and then you talk about it at work and then you see it on the news and you talk about it at work and it's as if you can never escape it. So, you know, I had to figure out ways to, to self-care. I had to figure out ways to step away when I needed to so I could recharge and kind of get back out there on the front lines in a way. So um, I'm thankful for the opportunity to continue these conversations and to continue these very, very direct truth sharing moments. But, but again, if nothing else, it just leaves me with this feeling of sadness and emptiness that this is still necessary. Um, you know, Christy, what you just said, I, I think back to um, my feeling like, I hope I do my job so well that it becomes an extinct industry to be in. You know, I, I, I would love for this not to even need to be a job. Um, I think for me, <clears throat> it did change a bit of how I went about my work in DEI. Um, 2020, you know, while it was a, a year of trauma and um, tragedy, for me, it was also a, a year of me deciding to live in all of my Black fullness and be very unapologetic for it. Um, whether it was about my hair or about the way that I speak, um, some things I left in 2019, I refused to code switch. I refused to straighten my hair to get into a space. I refused to do any of those things. So the way that I approach business changed a bit. So yeah, you'll see me with a big old Afro and I'm not mad about it. Um, but the other thing it did was um, it showed me how many people were ignorant and not willful. Right. So you have some people who are truly just ignorant and not willfully ignorant, but you also have people who are willfully ignorant. You know, they kind of lean into it. They're OK with that. Um, and it allowed me to find and I tell Candace this all the time and Amy, you and probably Christy as well. It it made me find a space for grace. And when I say a space for grace, it made me want to have conversations with people who wanted to hear from me. And instead of saying things and talking to people and having workshops and facilitations where I am trying to make people who are not Black comfortable with my Blackness or comfortable with the content, I gave them an opportunity to speak to, from their own lived experiences. How do they feel? How did it make them feel? And how does what they, how is what they feel? How does that affect me? And being very authentic and very personal because what I've noticed about folks is they don't like talking about racial things. You know, that's just a, an uncomfortable thing to have to talk about, but they don't mind talking to people, right? Mm -hmm. And when you are talking to someone as a human about an experience, most people, and I will say most, most of the people I've encountered, whether they were white or Hispanic or anything else, they understand that and they empathize. If you have a real conversation about real experiences, they find a place of empathy. And so I try to make sure I keep that, you know, space there where I'm open to a different perspective and lean all the way into my Afro. Those are the things that changed for me in, in uh, 2020. I think Mia, your, your uh, reference to willful ignorance is, is really one of the hardest parts of this past year. And, and again, that's what I was sort of alluding to is how people hardened their stances against uh, racial justice um, with that willful ignorance. But I really honestly uh, agree with you that sort of that storytelling is a way to get around that because we think about, too many people think about racial justice or injustice as a stance or as a political um, view. It when it's about, it's about real lives, as you said, it's about us. And if we can connect human to human in all of our ethnicity, um, then I, I think that's um, a way forward for us. Absolutely, thank you so much. How do you recharge and how do you practice self-care? I know for me, self-care normally looks like a glass of wine 
after a long day of trainings because I need to clear my head a little bit or log in off of social media because I, I can't stand to see any more of it. So I would love some advice maybe just for me personally and of course for the entire audience, but how do you practice self-care? That's a great question. I, and I think self-care is extremely important for people of color in the climate that we're in. What works for me, a few things. Meditation is one. Uh, I use the Calm app to meditate at least 10 minutes at a time. And that really just helps me escape everything and just kind of get lost in my own thoughts as I can try to refocus and recenter myself. Fitness has been another uh, prior to this event, I went out for a, a nice walk on this warm day, just getting that sunlight, getting those endorphins moving. Rest, rest works, right? We have to take a break because we are being called more to do the work of telling our stories, informing people of what needs to be changed and how we can make things happen. We have to take the time to rest. And so those three things are pivotal for me. Yeah, and for uh, me as well, Amy, I disconnect from social media sometimes um, for, it could be a month or two or, you know, whatever time I feel is necessary, I disconnect um, from the TV. There are days that I won't even turn it on. Um, and so it's just trying to kind of center yourself, but then also knowing when to say no. Um, having these conversations um, can be uh, very draining, you know, so you have to realize when you're getting to that point where you just need to say, I can't be involved in this conversation or, um, you know, I work in the HR space. It's interesting how, uh, which is a good thing, I guess, you know, it's, it's not that very, it's not many African-Americans in HR, not here in Nashville. So uh, typically when we speak about diversity in the workplace, we are tasked with uh, fixing, if you will, diversity, you know, for the whole company. So for me, it is um, kind of getting the, the courage enough to say, I can't fix that. <laughs> um, it, it's too heavy of a load. So, you know, it's already uh, a heavy, you know, I love being Black. I love my Blackness, but it's a heavy load, you know. So that in itself to go to work and, and to be the minority consistently, but then also to be tasked with um, with changing the uh, and whole, a whole culture or environment. It's fine if that's what you have uh, gone to school for and, and you have your experience in, but to assume that we know how to fix this just because we are a minority, you know, that's, that's a, a, a terrible assumption. So it's knowing when to say no on a lot of levels in the workplace and at home and when to shut it down and cut it off. For me, my, oh, I'm sorry, Christy. No, Mia, go ahead. Uh, for me, my self-care is doing activities that restores my faith in humanity. Uh, you know, I, it, going to the grocery store sometimes really does restore my faith in humanity um, because in a grocery store, you're in an environment with people from all different walks of life. And every time I get a chance to catch somebody being good to me, just because they are good people and good humans, I revel in it. Um, if they open the door for me and I say, thank you, I'm happy. If they scoot out the way, um, if I'm going down their aisle, I'm happy, you know, I say thank you, or they say thank you, or they say excuse me. Um, those type of things that I find restoring to my soul, because if I watch TV and if I just look at social media, I would believe that the world is on fire. So I do things, I do things, I go places, masked up, of course, you know, I, I'm using all of the, the practices that we've been taught that we need to do, but I can't live in a closed off environment. I need human connection. I need that. And that is my self-care. Being around other people is self-care for me. I completely agree with that. I am an extreme extrovert. Anyone who knows me knows I need people like most people need air. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing I did that was really intentional to 20 for me in 2020, and it's going to sound strange, I think, to a lot of people is I searched for and thankfully found a tribe of phenomenal white women who 
they define ally, they define accomplice, they define so many things. And the reason I did that was I, I have I have friends that are, you know, great. I will do anything for them. They will do anything for me. Um, but I needed some people who did not look like me to restore my faith in humanity because I lost it. And I'll be the first to say 2020 caused me to look at this country in a way that I hadn't looked at it in the past. And it was hard. So I needed to have people and Candace is one of them. Courtney is one. Do, Sandra, Laura, like I could name my tribe. And it is a very deliberate and, and life affirming group of women who don't look like me. Their lives aren't like mine. But I know without a doubt, I could call any of them at any moment and say, hey, I need. And before I even finish that sentence, Brittany's on my front step, you know, saying, here I am. How can I help? So it was a different way for me to spend 2020. Um, I expanded my tribe. And for me, it really helped. It kept me sane. And it kept me, as Mia mentioned, from feeling like the whole world was on fire. It, it reminded me that there are some people standing there with buckets of water ready to help put it out. Well, I'll answer um, uh, sort of the opposite of several people. Um, my my self-care is really about routine. It's about not changing much of my life. It's about um, staying with, um, you know, I, I work from home. I was working from home before the summer of 2020. I work from home now. Um, I spend a lot of time at my uh, at one set of grandchildren's home. Uh, our quarantine is in those two homes. So the more we can keep that um, the same, the better, uh, the saner I am. Um, so, so my self-care has been more about um, doing the work that needs to be done and then getting back to the routine uh, of my life that, that feeds me, which is, which is my family. So um, that's my self-care. And because and I'm not an extreme extrovert, I am, a, um, I am an introvert um, who, who acts extroverted when I, when I have to. I'd like to add one more thing, uh, Amy, if I can. 2020 was tough for our community, not just because of the racial inequities and the challenges associated with it, but also due to the pandemic. So that compounded our challenges as a community. And what I have told those in my circle is that my, my quest is to be more compassionate and to embrace a more compassionate uh, energy around people that I deal with, because we don't know what anybody and everybody is going through, especially given everything that our community endured last year. So I encourage anybody and everybody around me, lead with compassion, give people the benefit of the doubt. We just don't know what folks are going through. Absolutely, thank you so much for um, adding that, Isaac. So one thing that that reminded me of, which I guess I try to forget, is there are lots of things that disproportionately affect our communities. And it's not just the pandemic. It's the idea that there are things that we experience as Black people in America that no one will ever experience. They don't have the histories behind it. They don't have the years of trying to play catch up. So looking at the pandemic, you know, there's lots of conversation about, well, the communities are disproportionately affected because they don't seek medical care. But we don't seek medical care as often as other because we have years and years of inequities in healthcare. We weren't, didn't have access to it. We were used as experiments. Our bodies were not our own. We weren't perceived to have the same feeling of pain or the same thickness of like crazy things that go through my mind every time I go to the doctor. Um, I had a tumor as an infant and my mom refused to take me to a particular hospital because they wanted to experiment on me because she was terrified of what would happen. Um, the conversations that we have with our children aren't the same because the outcomes aren't the same. Um, we did have a question or a comment for a panelist that I think Ms. Christie is going to address for us. Yes, and I'm sure others will chime in as well. So I remember when my daughter and my niece first started driving, 
And as you know, as, as a parent, it's a terrifying moment regardless, no matter who you are, because one of your biggest goals in life is to keep your children safe. I feel like at different moments, we would probably all bubble wrap our kids and just carry them with us if we could. But for me and for, for most black parents, it is a different kind of fear. Um, my niece cut her hair very, very short. From the back, she looked just like a boy. And when she started driving, my fear was when she got pulled over, they would see her color first and her person, her soul, her spirit, all of that second. My, mainly because the assumptions that people make based on race are very real and affect us in a very real way. I can't count the number of times that my husband has pull, been pulled over in our own neighborhood and asked, whose car are you driving? Why are you here? You know, are you sure this is your car? It has Christie's name on it. You know, like the, the type of questions that are asked are very different than what I've seen so many of my white friends be asked when and if they are pulled over. The level of fear when the police officer approaches the car, if I'm driving, if my husband's driving, something like that is different than what it is for other people. So I think there's some conversations that we all have with our kids and as parents, we all should have with our kids just a basic respect and safety. But you know, one of the things I am eternally grateful for is hearing the parents of my girls' friends say to them, their friends who are white, hearing their parents say to them, if something happens and you all get pulled over, you have one job and that's to protect Christiana because she's the one at risk in that moment because they understand that those kids are instantly going to be viewed differently. If they're out running in the mall and just being kids and having fun, those parents realize my child will be the one who the security officer comes to and asks questions and assume there was some problem. So, you know, parents who get that and who understand there is a difference and there's a difference that we can't control. All we can do is educate our kids and pray that other parents do the same for their kids. So my baby makes it home because it isn't just about whether or not you get a speeding ticket or something like that. It's whether or not you come home. And that's a level of fear no parent should have to face. But the truth is, we all do each and every time our kid walks out of that door. Christy, yeah, I'd like to. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. We all trying to jump in here. I didn't <laughs> want to dominate. I just wanted to add a little bit of context to what Christy spoke on so eloquently. There are some ugly truths in our nation that we just we have to accept. And once we accept them, then we can work forward to addressing them. My parents are immigrants from Ghana. They came to this country in their mid 20s. They raised their children in America as black children of Ghanaian descent. My parents still taught us all of these things because even though they didn't grow up here, they understood what blackness meant in America. And they wanted to ensure that their children were prepared for something that they didn't even have to experience or deal with. You know, I, I got a brand new car for my 16th birthday and I was super excited. I had it for two years and then I got married at 18 and my ex-husband was white. And we were driving through um, East Nashville and I got pulled over and I didn't think anything of it. My mom was a judge. I had a brand new car. Everything's fine. The officer walked over to my ex-husband's side of the car and asked him, was he okay? We didn't get pulled over for speeding. We didn't get pulled over for missing a light. None of that. He wanted to make sure the white passenger in my car was okay. Pulled me out of the car, searched my car. And when he didn't find anything, it was fine. But for almost a year after that, I refused to drive. I was absolutely terrified because what if the officer hadn't recognized my mom's name? What if that situation would have been different? And to this day, when I leave the house, my mother says to me, please be safe. I know you have a smart mouth. If you get pulled over, don't argue, don't fight, do whatever they say, because I want you to come home. Mm -hmm. And I know, like Christy said, it's all parents want their kids safe, but there's a different level of fear when you have this constantly in the media, driving while black has been a thing for as long as I think black people have been allowed to drive. And I, I, unfortunately, I don't see that changing anytime soon. So these conversations are gonna to have to continue. For me, I think that, you know, I have three kids, two boys um, and a girl. 
Um, but my boys are literally bolo, right? They are literally bolo. Be on the lookout. They are both tall between five, nine and six, two uh, black men. Um, they fit every description for every crime that they ever report on the news. And I think that the other harsh re reality um, that even as black people, we need to come to terms with is that it's policing, period. It's, and I think that sometimes um, the reason why you have a some pushback, people think that we are just talking about white police officers, but I have to say that the worst experience my son has ever had with a police officer was a black police officer. It was not a white police officer. It was a black police officer and it was horrible. He was in his own neighborhood. They weren't driving. They were walking home. They, we lived in a neighborhood that had you know a tennis court and a swimming pool and all of this and they are walking home with their friends and not even their black friends. It was my son, two, my, two of my sons with some of their white friends. And this black police officer pulled my black sons out and asked them, where were they going? Did they live over there? What was their address? He asked them all these questions. Their worst experience was, his worst experience was from a black officer. And so I think that it is the portrayal that people have of who a black boy is or um, a black young lady is, you know, they, I feel like the media portrays us. We don't have a chance to be children. There's never a time that we talk about black boys as black boys. We talk about them as black men and threats. And so they're always perceived that way. And the sad, the saddest part to me about it is they're perceived by everybody that way. And so even folks who think that they would not be that way, the, what the data says and, you know, being a consultant for People3 um, and, a, and a facilitator is all about the numbers. And so the, the data supports that. It's not just one group. And so I think that it's important when we have these type of conversations that, per, to, that we understand that that part of our struggle is on every front right? It's on every front. There is not a safe space. And I think finally, I'll say this, the saddest thing I ever heard my son say, um, and this is my horrible experience being a mother to Black children. Um, my middle son, there, his one of his friends was killed by another one of his friends. That, and I, I say friends, but they all went to high school together. And it, during that same time, you had all of this stuff going on with George Floyd. It was last year. And so he said to me, I literally walk out of the door every day afraid for my life because I don't know, I don't know where the enemy is. I don't know who the enemy is. I just feel like I'm always in danger. And that is no way for any human to live, not here, not anywhere, not ever. He should never think I'm afraid for my life at all times. And we're not that it should matter. It shouldn't matter that he's from a, you know, a, a decent family living in a decent neighborhood and has all of these things and he has a degree and has all of the things you're supposed to have to be, you know, a successful person in this world. It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, he is Bolo. He's be on the lookout for. Hey, I, I wanted to say something real quick and I know we're pressed for time, but um yeah, I think that's the reality of the events from last summer. What it, it just reminded us that it doesn't matter where we're from. It doesn't matter what we have. We are still black. And that's the first thing that people see. And so for me, I hear a lot of people say quite often, you know, I don't see color. I, I'm, I'm okay if you see color. <laughs> I want you, to. I want you to, to recognize that I am different. I just don't want you to treat me differently because I, I come from a different background. But just to kind of touch base on the conversation regarding the driving and the police, you know, pulling us over, I appreciate comments like the one that we received because it's, it allows us to have a honest conversation. I think um, one of the challenges is there are some people, there are some white people that just don't get it. Um, and I think we can't make anyone understand our experiences, but we can have conversations about it. And so for me, you know, um, we have uh, five children. And, and so our youngest 
uh, our youngest child that's able to drive. She's 17. And so, yes, I tell her, you know, we, we instruct her to, if you get pulled over, make sure you pull over right away in a safe area, make sure you have your hands visible. But at the end of the day, we're going to assume that first you're being pulled over for a reason, because we know there are plenty of times where we were pulled over for no reason at all. But also, uh, at the end of the day, a smart mouth, even if there is some question as to why I'm getting pulled over, should not result in death. You know, we had Sandra Bland, who was pulled over for a minor traffic violation. She's no longer here. That absolutely makes no sense to me. So a smart mouth where I tell her to respect authority, where I have taught her to respect us and her teachers, it should never, do we have an opportunity to learn? It should never result in death. Um, even as I think about the young man who was in his home eating a bowl of cereal, ice cream or whatever, a, a white police woman came in his home and shot him in his home. So it doesn't really matter where you are or what you do. He was in the safety of his own home, eating a bowl of ice cream. Our mob was jogging, which I'm assuming for exercise. Y you have Sandra Bland who was driving, trying to get somewhere. We are not treated the same. And so those having those conversations with our children, it, it's almost like, what are we instructing them now? And that's how I felt this summer. Um, with George Floyd, it, it wasn't even a counterfeit 20, I think is what was revealed. What are we, what do you say to your children? And that's the whole sad part of this, because there are a lot of instances where there is nothing wrong, but we are still targeted on so many levels. So when you see your children um, and, and you're trying to explain that to them, but also, um, just recognizing it's the fact that we are black that we're treated differently, it, it, it gets to be disheartening. But I think this is how we start to have conversations and dialogue about it. You may not understand it, but our experiences are definitely real. And the media is not, uh, they're, they're not just trying to, um, you know, explode with the whole racial uh, injustice. This actually happens. We are just now being able to see it displayed on every social media platform. And we're just uh, coming to the point where everyone has police cameras and all of that. But this is what we've experienced for years. You know, Nietzsche, I think everyone on the panel has heard me say this at least once. Unless you have a medical condition, you are not colorblind. And saying you are is a form of erasure. You, you cannot not see the fact that I'm African-American or more realistically black because I, I don't have roots in Africa. So I'm really not African-American, but that's a title that was put on me. I'm a black woman in America and every room I go into, I have to moderate my voice or I am run the risk of being kicked out. Um, if I have a smart mouth when I get pulled over, I might not make it home. The, that's part of the black experience that I think a lot of people don't recognize. How do our white allies or co-conspirators or accomplices or whatever terminology we wanna use for that, how, how can they do that? How do they stand up? And maybe more importantly, can you name a specific time in the past year that someone has stood in that gap for you or has done something to be impactful? I know, Christy, you talked about your tribe and I, I will say for myself, had it not been for Dr. Warner, my view on an entire group of people might've changed dramatically. Um, but like she, she is my village and I am so thankful for that. And I know that she's not the only one so I would love to hear some of your experiences. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead, Mia. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Ira. <laughs> okay, I was gonna also echo what Amy just said and thank Candace, Dr. Warner for creating this space because that's part of what that looks like. For my entire career in engineering, academia, in my community service, I have benefited from intentionality in terms of allies helping to break down some of what we've experienced as black people. And it looks like advocates who say, this gentleman is just as qualified as anyone else. 
we should really consider him for this job opportunity. This looks like a person saying he's just as talented as anyone else on this team. Let's let him have the opportunity to lead this particular project. That intentionality is real and it's transformative and it often does not require much, but just speaking up. And I've personally benefited from that from white allies, male and female in every organization that I've spent time in someone has looked at me and said, Isaac is just as capable and qualified as anyone else here. Why has he not had this particular opportunity? I'm going to speak up. We're going to give him that shot, watch him go and perform. That's what that looks like in whatever space you exist in as an ally, no matter what your gender, race, ethnicity, look at those people of color in that particular space. How are they being overlooked? Where can you use your voice to create opportunities for them? It's game changing. Um, for me, um, I'll, just in case y'all can't tell, I'm a country girl through and through. So I was born and raised in South Arkansas. And at my high school, there were not a lot of black students. I was one of like maybe six black girls in my whole class, um, maybe 12 black people all together. There were not any pe other people of color. You were either black or white. There was Possibly there were some other people that was something else, but you were not classified that way in Camden, Arkansas. When I was in school, you were either black or white. Um, and I have to say, for me, the allies that I have dealt with had, over the past year, especially, are a lot of my friends from high school, whom which are very country as well. And several probably voted for our last president the first time, might have circled back around and did it the second time. But you know what they did for me? Um, I asked them to talk to their relatives who were bigots. So let me just put that out there. I'm not in those rooms. They're not gonna say something foolish in front of me with me sitting there. They're not, they'll say it with you. So I can't check your racist family, you can't. I need you to go in your spaces and hold people accountable and really hold their feet to the fire. Um, a, a podcast I listen to a lot has Dan Savage and he's um, a voice in the LGBTQIA community. And he always says the biggest power that you have over family is your presence. And so if someone is erasing what you care about, you don't have to deal with them, but you need to let them know that's not okay. And I've had so many. Um, of course, here in Nashville, thankfully, I have Amy and Courtney. I'm, I'm sorry, not Amy, uh, Candace and Courtney and so many other uh, Leslie, uh, white women allies. Um, Mason, I have some white men allies here in Tennessee and a, and a whole slew of them in Arkansas. But the the, the things that they said on social media, I know you feel like sometimes that's nothing, but they took a lot of heat for some of the things that they posted on social media because I asked them to. And at least 40 of my friends from Camden, Arkansas, Lower Arkansas, went out there and talked a lot of smack to their people and they took heat for it, but they stood their ground. So for, the, for that, that meant the world to me. Yes, I have to echo seeing some of the posts on social media and seeing some of my friends who I knew they were risking something. They were risking mm -hmm. social capital. They were risking some relationships to really talk in a very honest and transparent way. And, and oftentimes it was with family members and that will always mean the world to me. And then just a, a very short story, which is the smallest thing, but it really mattered. I was shopping with a friend um, back when we could just go out with people and back in the good old days when the world was open, uh, but going in a store and there was a small boutique in Franklin I paid with a debit card. My friend paid with her husband's credit card and she was white. And I'm there with my debit card. I swipe it. I put my PN in and the clerk asked to see my ID. No big deal. I'm used to it. I don't think anything of it. I hand her my ID. We finish the transaction and I just step up a little bit. My friend then comes through with her credit card, her husband's credit card, swipes it, signs her name, there's no question about asking for ID or anything. And the clerk didn't realize we were together. And my friend said, you know, just out of curiosity, why didn't you ask for my ID? And the clerk's face looked very, you know, puzzled. And she said, oh, I see you here all the time. I know who you are. It's no big deal. 
My friend said, that's funny. I don't live here. I live in Alabama. I'm just here visiting. My friend Christy does shop here regularly. And of course, the, you know, the, the clerk's face changed. She was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I guess I just thought you were someone else. You know, I should have asked, da, 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 da. The reality is to that clerk, what she did was her norm. You know, that was her norm. She looked at me and she assumed this probably isn't her card. I better double check. She looked at my friend and assumed, I'm sure this is, fr- this is fine. In that simple act of having her just ask the question, because had I done it, it would have been perceived very, very differently. It would have been a situation that, you know, could have escalated. But having her ask the question on my behalf, what it, it reaffirmed that she was there and she was supporting and make that clerk rethink her actions. And it meant the world to me. So having those just small moments really does help so very much. And eventually those small moments kind of add up and they start changing hearts and changing minds. And then the other thing that I mentioned earlier was just having my daughter's friends, parents step in and talk to their children. That is life changing. That's how generations start changing. That's how we start seeing long-term change. Talking to them very honestly. This is your job. Your job is to protect her when she can't because they aren't listening to her voice. Your job is to advocate for those who can't because that's what needs to happen. So those moments, they they really do help and they may seem small, but they're not. They're really not. So in the interest of time, I think we can do one more question. Um, And I would like everyone, if you can, to answer in one sentence. So almost a key takeaway. What do you want Americans to know about the everyday experience of Black individuals as they walk through the world, as they walk in and out of your organizations, um, just as they exist in life? I guess I'll go first. The best way I can sum it up is to say it like this. Blackness is like a weighted blanket that you can't remove. You wear it everywhere you go. You're always reminded of it. And even when other people can't see it, you know it's there. Thank you, Isaac. I'll go. Um, It's kind of similar. I would say that every day can feel like a constant interview or like you're on trial. Thank you, Nitra. And I just want to say that um, the day George Floyd was murdered uh, did not change my life. I did not feel any more vulnerable the day he was murdered or the day after he was murdered than I did the day before. Um, the, the, what, what was awareness to lots of the world was just every day for, for many of us. And so, our, so a lot has changed, a lot has changed, but not immediately in my life. Um, I, I'm still living the same life I was living, um, before that, that incident. Thank you, Tony. And I would say my one sentence is, All realities are real, but all realities are not universal. So your truth and each each person's truth is not the same. And just remember, don't assume because something is happening to you, it's the same for other people. For Black people, it's always been different and, and unfortunately still is. Thank you, Christy. Um, my one sentence I would say is my experience may be a bit different because I am black, but I probably have more in common with you than you think. So please just talk to me and get to know who I am. Thank you so much, Mia. Whew. So I, I'm not gonna lie, I'm a little emotional, but having these conversations are so important. Um, I do wanna take this time to thank all of you for your participation today, for all of the people who tuned in Thank you for being a part of this conversation and for asking such great questions. 
We do recognize that there are still more questions than answers, but we hope this has been impactful. We invite you to continue to ask questions and seek thoughtful answers. Please feel free to reach out to People3 at info at people3.co and to utilize the anti-racism resources available on our website, people3.co.